my shoes so you don't know what it feels like. Look at this. Look at this. Look at us. Kevin, I'm not looking over look there, at man. our circumstances, man. Look where we from. I'm tired of this, man. I'm sick of worrying about wet cars. I'm sick of worrying about the government. I can't eat. I'm broke, nigga. I'm broke. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 6 I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee thou shalt see it no more again and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for born men and born women, and no man shall buy you. God warned Israel that if they broke God's commandments, he would send them back into Egypt on ships. The word Egypt carries different meanings in the Bible. One of those meanings is the house of bondage. Which people do you know were taken into bondage on ships? Deuteronomy 28 verse 48 Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Why didn't the Christian church ever teach us that God allowed the heathen to enslave our people due to our sins? In Deuteronomy 28 verse 48, Yah prophesied that Hebrews would become reliant upon other races for all of our needs. Negroes have become the most dependent people on the earth. In Africa, Israelites depend on colonizers who rob the continent, oppress our people and control our governments. In the other lands that Hebrews have been scattered to, Negroes do not own any major international banks, businesses, brands, airlines, hospitals, technology companies, etc. We don't even own the companies that produce our hair products and skin creams. Do you see how low in society we have become? Our disobedience to God's law has come with a punishment of making us rely on races that despise us to supply our needs. We are the only race of people on earth that are perpetually in this condition. This is how we know that we are God's true Israelite children. Psalms 44 verse 11 Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for me, and hast scattered us among the heathen. Deuteronomy 28 verse 65 And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, a failing of eyes, and a sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. Do you see how these other nations batter and beat down our people? The Most High prophesied in the scripture that among these nations that we've been scattered to, we wouldn't find any ease. Our lives have not been easy, they've been full of hardship. 
We're like sheep among wolves in this world. And when they devour us, no one even cares. We suffer without deliverance. And that's why we need to understand only the Most High is the solution to what we endure. Where's the outcry in the amongst black people in the Arab Muslim world when you can see we can see from out from where we are that there's still slavery going on with black people and Muslim Arabs? Where is the outcry within the actual uh, community within the black community within within Islam? It's like they don't it's like they don't care about it. it's like they're just used to that that being their status and it's like there's no it's like there's, their pride's gone. We're shocked to find this woman offering to sell us a child. The young girl seems withdrawn and confused. Okay. About a hundred years ago, the British Empire came to this country with their missionaries and they told the people, they told the people that Jesus should be believed in as God. Yes, they tried to take your minerals, they tried to take your gold. The Arab conquest of North Africa, was that a form of colonization? Absolutely. That the Arab conquest of North Africa was a form of colonization that took place uh, in the 7th century when Arab Muslims burst out of Saudi Arabia and conquered Egypt and went on to conquer the, the whole of North Africa. There were a lot of Berber tribes there. The Egyptian Copts were the original indigenous of the land as well as the Berbers. And they were all conquered and Islamized and Arabized. Uh, that was also a form of a colonization, definitely. Now, do Muslims today acknowledge this? Uh, are they self-critical about this? Now, do Muslims today acknowledge this? Uh, are they self-critical about this? Now, do Muslims today acknowledge this? Uh, are they self-critical about this? Now, do Muslims today acknowledge this? Uh, are they self-critical about this? This is from Sahih Muslim 1602, yeah? And I want you guys to read what the chapter's called. It's not chapter 23. It says the permissibility of selling animals for animals of the same kind and of different quality. Yeah? So this chapter is about selling animals, yeah? Mm -hmm. There came a slave and pledged his allegiance to Allah's apostle, which is Muhammad. Mm -hmm. On migration, the Holy Prophet did not know that he was a slave. And then there came his master and demanded him back. Whereupon Allah's apostle said, sell him to me. And he bought him for two black slaves. And after he did, and he did not afterwards take allegiance from anyone until he asked him whether he was a slave or a free man. Now the prophet, mm -hmm. their prophet, mm -hmm. has now bought this other man, mm -hmm for two black slaves. Yeah. So he's got two black ones, and this guy's like, ah, okay, take this one. He's like, all right, I'll mm. get two black ones. But yeah. look at the chapter, bro. Mm -hmm. It's a permissibility for selling animals, brother. So they come Right. Can I, so, can, who, so, they so, so, who's, so who's the animal? Can, can, the, can, the two black men are. Can, can, so yeah, one of our Nigerian brothers that's gonna address an issue that's you know been coming up for a while now, is when you have a lot of African people going to Arab countries to work, they're suffering. They're suffering a lot in these places. And the brother wanted to just kind of address some of that. Let's go ahead and roll it. You know, this is the point that you guys need to understand. You can label Africans. You can demonize us. You can deny your own tendency to be evil. You can deny your Arab supremacy because you have it. You can deny all these things and pretend like it doesn't exist, like you're not racist. But the truth is African lives don't matter in Arab countries, and that is a fact. 
That's the most inhumane society where any African can live. Go and verify. Check online. In some African countries in Kuwait and some other Arab countries in Kuwait and some other Arab countries, they, they publicize merchandising black Africans as slaves. There are applications that you can install on your phone and through the application you can buy black Africans as slaves in many Arab countries. Many Arab countries. Go and verify. So you can label us criminals. You can say all these things and pretend and deny and fool yourself. You are racist. You are inhumane. There is nothing godly about you. Muslims, like their Western Christian counterparts centuries later, regarded the enslavement of black Africans as a blessing in disguise to the victims. Black slaves, it was believed, were fortunate in that they were spared the barbarities of their own kind, and even more so because they were destined to be introduced to the religion and civilized values of Islam. With the black used as an example of simplicity and piety, Blacks generally are unfavorably depicted in medieval Islamic literature and arts as savages in adventure literature, demonized in fairy tales or commonly referred to as lazy, stupid, evil-smelling and lecherous slaves. Writing on the image of blacks in Turkish folklore, P. N. Boratav points out that the Negro is nothing more or less than the symbol of wickedness and barbarism. Similarly, Studies on the image of blacks in medieval Iranian writings reveal that in both Arab and Persian Muslim writings, blacks are depicted as stupid, untruthful, vicious, sexually unbridled, ugly and distorted, excessively merry, and easily affected by music and drink. Some Persian romances add to these stereotypes the images of blacks as cannibals, infidels, enemies of God and Islam, who attack and attempt to occupy Muslim lands. Jihad is portrayed as the only response to the infidel Zanj, the Persian equivalent of Negro, whom God himself once destroyed. The killing of a single black is penance for a lifetime of sin. Great Arab Muslim geographers such as Ibn Hawqal of the 10th century simply did not see the need to waste ink and paper recording anything about blacks. He wrote, I have not described the country of the African blacks and other peoples of the torrid zone because naturally loving wisdom, ingenuity, religion, justice and regular government, how could I notice such people as these or magnify them by inserting an account of their countries? Other renowned medieval Muslim thinkers such as the Spanish Said al-Andalusi wrote that blacks are more like animals than men and that the rule of virtue and stability of judgment is lacking among them, with foolishness and ignorance general among them. Blacks, according to Al-Andalusi, have never made use of their minds in seeking after wisdom, nor exercised themselves in the study of philosophy. Others, such as Ibn Sina (980–1037), similarly depict blacks as inherently inferior and destined to be enslaved by the rest of mankind. To Ibn Sina, blacks are people who are by their very nature slaves. As far as Nazir al Din Tusi, 1201-1274, a famous Iranian philosopher, was concerned, if various kinds of men are taken and one placed after another, like the Negro from Zanzibar in the southmost countries, the Negro does not differ from an animal in anything except the fact that his hands have been lifted from the earth except for what God wishes. Many have seen that the ape is more capable of being trained than the Negro and more intelligent. Ibn Khaldun on his part wrote that blacks are only humans who are closer to dumb animals than to rational beings. The reason for their characteristic levity, excitability and great emotionalism, according to Ibn Khaldun, is due to the expansion and diffusion of the animal spirit in them. They are therefore remote from those of human beings and close to those of wild animals. Blacks are ignorant of all religion and cannot be considered human beings. Therefore, the Negro nations are, as a rule, submissive to slavery because Negroes have little that is essentially human. A large number of East African slaves, 
the Zanj, were employed in their thousands on the sugar plantations of Khuzistan and saltpeter mines of the Abbasid Caliphate, located on the Euphrates, as early as the 8th century. Apparently due to the harsh conditions to which they were subjected, they rose in numerous revolts, and between 868 and 883, their rebellion became a real threat to the Abbasid Caliphate. The hunting, kidnapping, purchase and traffic of Africans into servitude went on throughout the centuries but increased greatly in the 19th century after Said ibn Sultan, ruler of Muscat in 1832, moved to Zanzibar and established plantation farming. Here, Arab and Swahili Muslim slave traders took advantage of prevailing Indonesian conflicts and cashed in on the captives of war with stronger African tribes such as the Yao, Nyamwezi and Ganda, acting as crucial intermediaries and accomplices. Men like Tipu Tib and Rumaliza organized well-armed gangs of slave raiders in the interior with the sole aim of raiding smaller indigenous communities whom they could then march, both as commodities themselves and as porters of ivory, to the coast for sale. A.J. Swan describes one of Tipu Tib's slave caravans that he encountered during the last quarter of the 19th century. As they filed past, we noticed many chained together by the neck. The women, who are as numerous as the men, carried babies on their backs in addition to the tusk of ivory or other burden on their heads. It is difficult to adequately describe the filthy state of their bodies. In many instances, not only scarred by the cut of the chicote, a piece of hide used to enforce obedience, but feet and shoulders were a mass of open sores. Half-starved, ill-treated creatures who, weary and friendless, must have longed for death. In conversation, one of the headmen admitted that most of the slaves died during the journey of hunger and exhaustion. When asked what happens if any of the slaves became too ill or weak to continue the journey, the headman replied, Spear them at once, for if we did not, others would pretend they are ill in order to avoid carrying their loads. No, we never leave them alive on the road. They all know this custom. In response to another question as to who carries the ivory when a mother carrying a baby and ivory gets too tired to carry both, the headman replied, she does. We cannot leave valuable ivory on the road. We spear the child and make her burden lighter. Ivory first, child afterwards. The route from the interior of Africa through Lake Tanganyika to the coast was littered with skeletons as a result of slaves dying from exhaustion, hunger or the brutality of their couriers, sometimes still yoked together. Deaths during the journeys were so numerous that it has been estimated that for every slave who reached the coast in Zanzibar, four or five lives were lost in transit. An Arab slave dealer by name Sayeb bin Habib is reported in 1882 to have admitted that out of 300 slaves he acquired from the interior, only 50 reached the coast alive. David Livingston observed that if the slaughter committed during the raids is taken into account, in addition to the deaths along the routes, then the price of every single slave who arrived at Zanzibar would be about 10 lives. Bustling slave markets emerged in Zanzibar and along the East African coast. Many eyewitness accounts talk in very sobering terms of the loss of life along the route. One such account, given by an eyewitness in 1822, talks about a well near Bir Moshuru, where the ground around is strewed with human skeletons, the slaves who have arrived exhausted with thirst and fatigue. At one spot, there were more than 100 skeletons. Gustav Nachtigall talked about littered skeletons and half buried in the sand the mummified corpses of some children, still covered with the blue cotton rags at the same well. At other wells referred to as the wells of El Hamar, the skeletons were countless. The route itself was equally littered with skeletons accumulated at the rate of 80 and 90 a day. According to one major Denham, the Arabs laughed heartily at my expression of horror and said they are only blacks, Nambu, damn their fathers, and began knocking their limbs about with the butt end of their firelock saying, this was a woman, this was a youngster. The methods of killing exhausted or sick slaves 
and those who attempted to escape in East Africa were also used on the Trans-Saharan route. Nachtigal accompanied a caravan of hundreds of slaves from Bagrimi to the slave markets of Kuka and witnessed exhausted and sick slaves being slaughtered and their arteries cut open. A French observer estimated that the price for one slave sold in the slave markets of North Africa might represent the loss of 10 others who were killed in the raids or died in transit. Apart from this significantly high loss of life during the raids and the journey into servitude, conservative estimates suggest that between 11 and 14 million Africans were transported into Muslim lands outside tropical Africa over the past 14 centuries. A highly reputable 19th century Moroccan historian described the traffic and sale of blacks in North Africa markets as the heinousness of the affliction which has beset the lands of the Maghreb since ancient times in regard to the indiscriminate enslaving of the people of the Sudan and the importation of droves of them every year to be sold in the marketplaces in town and country where men trade in them as one would trade in beasts, nay worse than that. People have become so inured to that generation after generation, that many common folk believe that the reason for being enslaved, according to the holy law, is merely that a man should be black in colour and come from those regions. The holiest city of Islam, Mecca, became the centre of the slave trade in the world and remained so well into the 20th century. From there, slaves captured and brought from East Africa and the Sudan were distributed to all parts of Arabia and the Muslim world. It became a custom for pilgrims to take slaves for sale in Mecca or buy one or two slaves while on Hajj as souvenirs to be kept, sold or given as gifts. High-ranking Muslims who perform the pilgrimage are known to have always taken along large contingents of slaves as porters and guards and to tend their master's needs. One of those needs was, as one writer puts it, cash. Owners often use slaves as a kind of traveler's check. Mansa Musa of Mali, during pilgrimage in 1324 CE, took along a vast number of dignitaries and slaves to serve the same purposes. Slaves became a permanent feature of pilgrimage arrangements. Many unsuspecting free people were taken on pilgrimage, sold or arrested on trumped up charges and ultimately ended up as slaves. A significant proportion of male black slaves were castrated and used in Muslim lands as eunuchs to guard the harems and serve as attendants at holy sites such as the Kaaba at Mecca and the Prophet's Mosque at Medina. They formed a special class of highly prized slaves kept by Muslim rulers and bourgeois from the heart of the Muslim world to Muslim Africa. Ethiopia was for a very long time the main source of eunuchs from the Muslim world, even though from the mid-18th century, Bagirimi became the main exporter. The operation, done on boys aged between 8 and 10, though prohibited under Islam, was carried out with an exceedingly high death rate. Gustav Nachtigal was told that, on the whole, about 30% survived the operation in Bagirimi, while other estimates put the mortality rate up to 80%. This barbaric act was made particularly cruel for black victims in that, in contrast to their white counterparts, whose operation did not deny them the ability to perform coitus, the castration of blacks involved what was popularly referred to as a level with the abdomen, i.e. a complete amputation of the genitalia. Deuteronomy 28 verse 36 The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known and there shalt thou serve other gods wood and stone. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 64 And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Psalm 106 verse 35 But they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols which were a snare unto them. 
The Most High Yah exiled us from the promised land because we refused to keep his commands. Israel has turned to the idolatrous religions of our enemies. The Muslims and Christians enslaved and hated our people. Yet black people follow Christian denominations founded by slave masters to this day. Negroes bow down in prayer to Mecca, a place where their ancestors were sold as slaves to Arab Muslims who saw them as black dogs and sex slaves. The Catholic and Christian church grips our people in a chokehold with its satanic rituals and idolatry. They have perverted the holy faith and spiritually enslaved our people with their satanic white Jesus. They corrupted and distorted the holy path. Jeremiah chapter three, verse one. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 verse 12 For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication and the invention of them the corruption of life. We have spiritually cheated on our God with other religions. Therefore he's forsaken our nation like a husband who has divorced an adulterous wife. Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 20 to 23 Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings, before we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Even though we have been unfaithful to our God, he is still calling us home to his love and mercy. There is no help or salvation for a black people in the idols of the Gentiles. Come back to Yah and his new covenant law Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 13 Then shall ye know that I am the Lord when their slain men shall be among their idols round about their altars upon every high hill in all the tops of the mountains and under every green tree and under every thick oak and the place where they did offer sweet savour to all their idols. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 28 But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. The religions that we have inherited from the heathen have failed us. Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, Pentecostalism, the Protestant Church, the Evangelical Church, the Orthodox Church, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, New Age Spiritualism and traditional religions have not delivered our people. Israel, 
we must forsake the false religions of the Gentiles and turn to the new covenant laws of Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 27 to 30 And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left for you in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt see the Lord thy God, Thou shalt find him, if thou seek him, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice. Exodus chapter 7 verse 16 And thou shalt say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. We are Hebrews, not Gentiles. Hebrews are to serve the God of the Hebrews not the man-made gods of the Gentiles. It's time for our scattered people to separate from these idols and obediently seek Yahuwah Elohim. Allahu uh, Akbar وَإِن تُبِدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُوفُوهُ يُحَاسِبِكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُهَمِّلْنَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ وَأَفُ أَنَّا وَاكْفِرْ لَنَا اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْ Allahu Akbar In Buddhist history A practice that spans over 2,600 years ago The Pindapad Pindapad is an ancient Buddhist tradition Which harks back to the times of the Buddha himself this sacred practice involves monks and nuns embarking on a humble journey, moving from door to door and along the roadside, collecting alms from the villagers. It's a practice born of compassion and mutual support. In exchange for the generosity of the community, the monastics dedicate themselves to meditation, the study of Buddhist scriptures and sharing their spiritual practices within all those who seek guidance. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship that nurtures both the givers and the receivers. Bhante Budarak explains the significance of Pindapat and the remarkable development that's the recent ordination of seven Buddhist nuns who joined for three weeks. This event is a testament to the Indian Africa ki Akra city. Jhapar Mojud hai native African Hindu ki subse jada abadi. Jo her sal birthi hizari hai. आप अफ्रीकन हिंदू हाँ। हम हिंदू, हम 
was born into it. Being a Hindu means love. साल 2009 में यहाँ केवल 12,500 हिंदू रहते थे जो साल 2010 में बढ़कर 25,000 हुए और अब एट प्रेजेंट में दो लाख पचास हजार ऐसी ज्यादा नेटिव अफ्रीकन हिंदू Mi benedica Dio Onipotente, Padre, Figlio e Spirito Santo. The Day of the Dead Festival in Porto Prince, Haiti's capital. Voodoo practitioners here dressed in white and painted their faces to represent spirits called Gede, which means the dead. This year's festival saw the participation of hundreds of revelers. We have one body. When we are dead, we use our spirits to enter people's heads so that we can dance. We do not have two bodies. And now, with all the insecurity issue, we must ask government and members to find a way to resolve it. Revelers offered candles and money to a voodoo priest who spat moonshine on the faces of practitioners, with some of them shaking and stumbling as they received the spirit of the dead. Voodoo is an official and widely practiced religion in Haiti, a country of more than 11 million people. I'm in western Nigeria, the heart of the Aruban people, where every summer thousands of people gather in this sacred grove in the town of Ashoku. With 100 million worshippers, this is one of the world's 10 largest religions. We pray with singing, we pray with bells, we pray with dancing and having fun. Carried to the New World by slaves, the faith is experiencing a renaissance among their descendants. Although we left Africa, Africa never left us. But when they come back here, what will they find? And what will they feel? I'm scared, I'm excited, I'm overwhelmed, but I'm here. Lagos is Nigeria's biggest city, the heart of the Yoruba people. Alafia Stewart and Oni Yebie Hinton are Americans in Africa for the first time. Raised in the Orisha tradition, they're here to be initiated as priestesses. The initiation will last three days and involve prayer, head shaving, and animal sacrifice. New blessings. When my hair was cut, it was symbolizing all of the negative that's happened before going away so that everything that's new will grow stronger, be more blessed, and have more ashe. The final part of the ritual is a public celebration. Alafia and Oni's American friends assemble to witness their induction. As in many religions around the world, the holiest moments of Orisha worship pay homage to the gods with animal sacrifice. 
I think of it as being no different than kosher meat. It's been prayed over, and the fact that that animal has given its life for my life and given its life for me to be uplifted, I'm so thankful to these animals and for what they've done for me. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 22 But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and non deliverer for a spoil and non safe restore. Enslaving our people, stealing our land, wealth, ain't enough for these other nations. But even still the way we walk, <laughs> talk, dress, rap, wear our hair and then they'll turn around and racially insult us. It's crazy out here. Proverbs 22 and 22 Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Proverbs 22 and 23 for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. Step onto a Jamaican construction site and you might wonder, what's with all the Chinese workers? These boots on the ground, part of China's foray into the Caribbean, bringing with it Chinese loans, but also friction. These are the beginnings of a much needed children's hospital, a gift from China, but one with strings attached. It's their contractor, up to 50% their workers, leaving many in the local industry cut out. At sites across Jamaica, it's often like that, except it's usually alone, a big one. So they're doing a number of buildings looking very similar to that one. And that has engineer Carvel Stewart speaking out. You're saying China essentially loaned money to itself to do work in well, another country? Well, well, that's what it did because it, it lends you the money and on the bottom of it, it says the beneficiary is China Harbor Engineering Company. The people who build the roads the and do the projects. The people build the road and do the project. While the infrastructure is needed, the added debt, he says, is not, especially if China's investment doesn't improve the economy in the long run. We will be seeking funds to repay those loans later on without having had the opportunity for the economy to earn from those funds. To understand who wins and who loses, we're hitting the road. Jamaica borrowed $700 million to have a Chinese state-owned firm build this toll highway. A thousand Chinese were imported to do the work alongside Jamaicans. It's also the first pillar we see of China's strategic plan. And According to the South African government's land audit report, farmland and agricultural holdings make up 91% of the total land in South Africa. 2.6% of the land is categorized as urban. 65% of South Africa's population lives on urban land. Of the farm and agricultural land owned by individuals, whites own 72% of the total. Africans own 4%. As stated in the report, colored own 15%, Indians own 5%. Of the remaining, 3% is owned by others and 1% is co-owned. Of the urban land owned by individuals, whites own 49%, Africans own 30%. According to the report, colored own 8%, Indians own 8%, 3% is owned by others, and 2% is co-owned. But the audit will not help government keep track of progress made in addressing racially skewed land ownership. The database from uh, uh, Home Affairs is no longer classifying people in terms of race since uh, 1994. But we will pursue uh, uh, that because we believe we need to know, you know, how many black people own land, how many white people own land, how many companies own land. The extent of foreign ownership could also not be determined. Tulasizwa Semelane, Pretoria. Good morning. How can I help you? 
I was just checking out these artifacts. They tell me you're the expert. Ah, uh, you could say that. They're beautiful. Where is this one from? The Bobo Ashanti tribe, present day Ghana, 19th century. For real? And what about this one? That one's from the Edo people of Benin, 16th century. Now, tell me about this one. Also from Benin, 7th century. <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. I beg your pardon. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda, and it's made out of vibranium. <laughs> Don't trip. I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? All the people of the world spoil and plunder our nation. No one stops them from colonizing our lands, taking our resources and appropriating our culture. No one cares to plead our cause. We may protest and march, but our voices are ignored and change never comes. Yah has promised to plead on our behalf and Yah has promised to spoil those that have robbed us. Cry out to Yahuwah in your frustration, Israel, for the justice of our nation comes from him alone. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curses thee, and blessed be he that blesses thee. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thy own head. O oh, as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Our destiny is to break these chains of oppression and overcome our oppressors. Yah has decreed that all nations shall serve our people. In the day of the Lord, all that the heathen have done to us will be returned upon their own heads and we will be delivered. Hallelujah. Behold, we are servants this day and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And he yieldeth much increase unto the kings who thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we in great distress. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 33 The fruit of thy land and all thy labours shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 7 Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Amen. 
Oppression is supposed to infuriate us. Oppression is supposed to make us zealous in seeking Yah's judgments upon the heathen that devour our people. Black people have become complacent with oppression. And rather than rise up and return to God's commandments, our people sit on their hands and continue in sin. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 43 The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. 44 He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Israel is cursed with being at the bottom of society. Which people do you know are always doing worse than the nationality surrounding them, regardless of where they are. We've spent a long time sat at the bottom. When will we take hold of God's laws and covenant and rise up? Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Lamentations chapter 1 verse 5 Her adversaries are the chief, her enemies prosper, for the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Our enemies have taken the chief position in society. They are our governors, bankers and superiors. Our sins prevent our people from prospering and the other nations know that. That is why they use the media and celebrities to promote sins to our nation. James chapter 2 verse 5 Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Revelations chapter 2 verse 9 I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 Because thou sayest I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretch, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. God loves an underdog, and he will establish our poor nation above all who have trodden us down. Baruch chapter 3 verses 6 to 12 For thou art the Lord our God, and thee, O Lord, will we praise. And for this cause thou hast put thy fear in our hearts, to the intent that we should call upon thy name, and praise thee in our captivity, for we have called to mind all the iniquity of our forefathers that have sinned before thee. Behold, we are yet this day in our captivity, where thou hast scattered us for a reproach and a curse, and to be subject to payments according to all the iniquities of our fathers which departed from the Lord our God. Hear, Israel, the commandment of life, give ear to understand wisdom, how happeneth it, Israel, that thou art in thine enemy's land, that thou art waxen old in a strange country, that thou art defiled with the dead, that thou art counted with them that go down into the grave. Thou hast forsaken the fountain of wisdom, for if thou hast walked in the way of God, then shouldest have dwelled in peace forever. We must acknowledge our condition and understand that our ancestors were in the same predicament. Just like them, we have been given to our enemies as captives. And just like them, we will be delivered when we return to the Heavenly Father. Psalm chapter 17 verses 13 to 14 Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, 
Deliver my soul from the wicked which is thy sword, from men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. Psalm chapter 9 verse 5 Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name for ever and ever. These wicked, devil-worshipping heathen have taken over the world that Yah made for us to rule. They prosper abundantly whilst they crush us. Psalm chapter 73 verses 3 to 12 For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. We forfeited rulership of the earth when we broke our covenant with God. Now we must look as our enemies rule in our stead and they turn this world upside down. However, understand that their time of punishment is coming next. Jeremiah chapter 30 verses 8 to 11 At that time I will break the yoke off their necks and remove their shackles. Foreigners will no longer enslave them, declares the Lord of heavenly forces. They will serve the Lord their God and the King whom I will raise up for them from David's family. So don't be afraid, my servant Jacob, declares the Lord. Don't lose hope, Israel. I will deliver you from faraway places and your children from the land of their exile. My people Jacob will again be safe and sound, with no one harassing them. I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. I will put an end to all the nations where I have scattered you, but I won't put an end to you. I won't let you remain unpunished. I will discipline you as you deserve. Revelation chapter 2 verse 26 And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 16 Yet all who ravage you will be ravaged. All who oppress you will go into exile. Those who rob you will be robbed. And all who plunder you will be plundered. Yeshua the Saviour is coming back to break the chains of the neck of Israel. He will restore us to our position of rulership. And he will avenge us of all who have done us wrong. Believe in the Messiah and return to his commandments. Christ is coming back for us, but we must be ready for him, Israel. Yah bless. Now let me say something right quick. I think back on the African American people in America. I think how that they were taken against their wills 
put in the belly of ships, brought over here, beat, cussed. Many of them died in the guts of those ships, thrown overboard. They were pulled from families over there. You ain't never heard a gut-wrenching song you hear a black person sing one of those old black Negro spirituals. Nobody knows. I can't sing it like that, see, because I hadn't experienced what they be. When you've experienced hell, it comes out of the voice. I said, when you experience hell, it comes out of the voice. If you're one of those people that you got problem with black people or whatever, you better shut your mouth because they're God's people. You better hear what I'm saying to you. You better, shut your, you better shut your white mouth. You better shut your white mouth. I'm not kidding you. I know some of you is raised in the deep south and you is raised by prejudiced people and bigoted people. You better get that out of your system. You better get it out of your system. It'll cause you to suffer right along with those masters. It'll cause you to suffer right along with them. These are God's people. And I know that there's wicked and white races and wicked and black races and all that. I'm not justifying none of that stuff. I'm just saying God knows what happened to the black race. He knows how they wound up over here. And God is going to re reimburse the black people for all their trouble and all their labor. You watch what I tell you. Watch what I tell you. Brethren, I pray you sing to the Lord a new song. Sing praise in the assembly of the righteous. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high place of God be on the mouths of the saints and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the demonic nations and punishments on those peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them this written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing to him a new song. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know where I'm from. When black folks started revolutions, they never had the firepower or the resources to fight their oppressors. Where was Wakanda? Hmm? You know that ends today. We got spies embedded in every nation on Earth, already in place. I know how colonizers think, so we're gonna use their own strategy against them. We're gonna send vibranium weapons out to our war dogs. They'll arm oppressed people all over the world so they can finally rise up and kill those in power and their children and anyone else who takes their side. It's time they know the truth about us. We're warriors. The world's gonna start over and this time we're on top. The sun will never set on the Wakandan empire. 